Ah, hello. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers of Pi Texas 2023. Thank you so much for putting on this conference. Uh, it's great to be in Austin. Uh, and I want to thank you for attending Pi Texas. Thank you. This is my talk, uh, Recursion for Beginners, a beginner's guide to recursion. Actually, this is my talk, Recursion for Beginners, a beginner's guide to recursion. Uh, my name is Al Swigert. I'm mostly known as the author of Automate the Boring Stuff with Python, but I have a new book that is out now. It's The Recursive Book of Recursion, uh, and you can read it for free under a Creative Commons license on my website, inventwithpython.com. So, what is recursion? Let's ask that website that knows all of our private thoughts. Okay, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. So, according to these suggestions, recursion is hard, confusing, magic, and bad. All right, okay, so let's start with a basic definition. Um, a recursive thing is something whose definition includes itself. So for example, here's a fractal, which is a recursive shape. This is called a Sierpinski triangle. It kind of looks like the Triforce from Legend of Zelda. Uh, I drew this one using the Turtle module that comes with Python. So Turtle is this old school drawing library that lets you programmatically create these Etch-a-Sketch style pictures. Uh, the shape we draw here is a triangle with an upside down triangle in the middle, uh, which forms three new triangles. And then you draw upside down triangles inside those triangles and so on forever. A Sierpinski triangle is made of three Sierpinski triangles. Its definition includes itself. So my book gives you the uh, source code for a lot of turtle programs that generate recursive artwork. They're surprisingly short. They're like 40 lines of code or something like that. Uh, this is a Sierpinski carpet made of squares within squares. You can also make a 3D version of this in Minecraft, in which case it's a Sierpinski cube. Uh, you can draw lots of these fractals with Python's turtle module. Uh, here's a recursive tree. Each branch splits into two self-similar branches. This one looks almost too perfect, though. But if we make the branches sprout random branches instead of self-similar branches, we end up with a much more natural-looking tree. Uh, there are some fractal curves we can draw. This is the Coke curve. Uh, you split a line into three parts, and then you change the middle part into a bump. Uh, and then you repeat this by adding more bumps to the new parts. And if you do this to the three sides of a triangle, you end up with a Coke snowflake. Uh, notice that when you add a bump to a line, you're actually making the line one third longer. And you can add bumps forever. So this is a fractal whose finite area contains an infinitely long line. Uh, there's a bunch of these curves. This one's called the Hilbert curve. You just take this shape and then you make three copies of it and you rotate them around and connect them and then that forms the new shape and you just make three copies of that and rotate them around and connect them but if you keep doing that uh, on some graph paper you have a contiguous line that touches every square of the graph paper uh, these are called space filling curves all of these are drawn in python and that's just the well-known fractals. You can invent your own fractals. Uh, one of the projects in the recursion book is a generic fractal maker. You just start with any shape, like this triangle, and then you specify what the recursive step is. So in this case, we're creating a new triangle to the left, right, and bottom, and we also resize and rotate them a little bit, and that becomes the new shape that you start uh, drawing to the left, right, and bottom. And if you do that for several more steps, you create a brand new, never-before-seen fractal. So here's the square, and in the recursive step, we draw four more squares in the corners, but we also toggle the color between white and gray, and I don't even know what this is, but it looks kind of cool. Or we can do it with three corners instead of four, in which case, uh, if you tilt your head about 135 degrees, it kind of looks like a Sierpinski triangle almost. Uh, there's no limit to the fractals that you can just come up with by just messing around. Uh, we're not just limited to geometric shapes either. You can apply recursion to images as well. Uh, this is a tin of a Dutch brand of cocoa called Drost Coco. I actually have one of these tins right here. Um, this image is recursive. The image contains itself. So we can create our own by using, the pi by using Python and the Pillow Image Library. Uh, so this is my friend at the Menil Museum in Houston. Uh, first, I add an area of magenta pixels. Magenta is really nice because it sticks out and it tends to not be something that naturally occurs in most photos. 
So our Python program identifies the size of the magenta area and then shrinks a copy of the photo and replaces all the magenta pixels with the smaller photo. But of course, this smaller photo has its own magenta area. So you keep repeating this process over and over again, and you end up with a Drost effect photo. So the code that does this is in the recursion book. Right, Al, I thought you said that this was a talk for beginners. Um, yeah, okay, that all, I know that looks really complicated and fancy and everything, but I won't say that recursion is easy, but I will say that recursion isn't as hard as you think. Uh, let's get a simple definition specific to programming. In programming, recursion is when a function calls itself. So here is the shortest possible recursive function. All it does is call itself. And that's like, it, it's kind of weird, right? Like, does that work? And the answer is no, no, it does not work. Uh, the error it gives you is recursion error, maximum recursion depth exceeded. And this kind of error is called a stack overflow. Hey, that's the name of that website. Okay, so there's this joke that everyone always says whenever you mention recursion. To understand recursion, you must first understand stack data structures and function calls. Um, yeah, so this is the main reason why recursion is tricky, because teachers don't explain these two concepts first. Uh, let's start with stacks. Stacks are one of the simplest data structures in computer science. A stack is a data structure that holds an ordered sequence of data and only lets you interact with the topmost item. So, for example, uh, you can think of a stack as a stack of playing cards. We can add cards to the top of the stack, and we can remove cards from the top of the stack, but you can't insert them into the middle. Uh, so if you think about it, the first card that you put on the stack will be the last card to be removed. So we call a stack a phylo data structure because the first thing in will be the last thing out. Okay, so stacks have their own terminology. Adding data to the top of a stack is called pushing. Removing data from the top of a stack is called popping. And uh, conversations can be like a stack. So uh, let me, yes, there we go. Conversations can be like a stack. So I want to tell you a story about my friend Alice. But before I tell you that, I got to tell you about my other friend Bob. But before I can tell you about Bob, I need to tell you about his wife, Carol. So then I tell you about Carol, and then I get back to my story about Bob. I finish that story, and then I get back to my story about Alice. So that conversation has a stack-like structure. The story I'm currently telling you will be the one that's at the top of the stack. So in fact, you've already worked with stacks. Python lists act the same way as stacks, as long as you restrict yourself to just append and pop. So in this case, the last item in the list is the top of the stack. So here's, uh, we're appending some strings uh, to a list, Alice, then Bob, then Carol. Then we pop the list, which returns Carol. And then if we check this, the uh, list there, you can see that Bob is now the top of the stack, or rather the end of the list. So that's how stacks work. There's not much to them. Uh, the second thing you need to know about are function calls. Now, you already kind of know this, but it helps to have someone explicitly tell you when you call a function, uh, you're not just going on a one-way trip into the function call. The Python interpreter needs to remember where to return to when the function call returns. So if we have a function A that calls function B that calls function C, when C returns, it goes back to B, which goes back to A, which goes back to the global scope. Now, the way that the Python interpreter keeps track of function calls is with a stack. And uh, this stack is called the call stack. So Python puts frame objects on the call stack, and frame objects contain the data of where the execution should return to after the function call returns. So you can think of a frame object as representing a function call. We push a new frame object onto the call stack when a function is called, and we pop it off the call stack when the function returns. The topmost frame object is the function call the execution is currently in. Uh, you know, but when we look at our code, you might wonder, uh, where's the call stack exactly? Because you can't see it. This is something that the Python interpreter handles for you automatically behind the scenes. So uh, you can't point to your program anywhere and say, there, that's the call stack. It's invisible. And if your teacher is not telling you about this, uh, recursion is just going to seem like some mysterious, invisible thing. OK, so that's stacks and function calls. But one more thing, recursion is overrated. 
Uh, or at least recursion is overused. You know, people like to use recursion when they don't have to. Uh, it doesn't make the code simpler. It, in fact, does the opposite. But programmers will do this anyway because one of the most irritating things programmers do regularly is feel so good about learning a hard thing that they don't look for ways to make it easy or even oppose things that would do so. This is so true, I'm going to have it tattooed to my forehead. And I think it's really telling that there are two algorithms every recursion tutorial uses, and they are both terrible examples of recursion. Yes, the classic algorithms, factorial and Fibonacci. OK, so this is factorial. It's a math thing. Uh, 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, or 120. 2 factorial is 2 times 1. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. You can see the pattern. Uh, the interesting thing about factorial is if you look at it, uh, specifically 5 factorial, that's the same as 5 times 4 factorial. We can generalize this pattern. Uh, the factorial of any number is that number times the factorial of that number minus 1. So the definition of factorial includes itself. It has a recursive nature. So we can translate this into Python code. Let's make a factorial function, and it returns the number parameter times the factorial of number minus 1. And this seems kind of weird. Does this actually work? And the answer is no. No, it does not. Uh, this will crash with a stack overflow. So why does that happen? Well, if you think about it, uh, this is 5 factorial. But our factorial function is actually doing this. We forgot it to, to tell it to stop at 1, so it just keeps going. So if you ever have a stack overflow, the problem is that your algorithm never stopped recursing. Uh, programs can't make recursive calls forever because every function call adds a frame object to the call stack, and that takes up a little bit of memory. So an infinite recursion would eventually eat up all of your computer's available memory, and Python goes ahead and just cuts it off after about a th uh, at 1,000 function calls without any return. So this is why the stack trace right here has four function calls, and then it says repeated 996 more times. Now, to fix the stack overflow problem, we want to stop recursing when the number argument is 1. So here's a hint. 1 factorial is always 1. So let's add some code that checks if number is 1. And in that case, we can have it return 1. And this case is called the base case. The base case is the circumstance under which you stop making more recursive function calls. And then the recursive case is when we make a recursive function call. Your recursive function must always have at least one base case and one recursive case. Uh, this kind of makes sense if you think about it, because if you don't have a base case, then your recursive function is just going to recurse forever and cause a stack overflow. And if your recursive function doesn't have a recursive case, it's not a recursive function. It's never actually calling itself. So at least one base case and one recursive case. And you might still look at this function and think, yeah, OK, I, you know, I see how that works kind of, but like, where does the 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 happen? Um, so it kind of happens across several function calls of the call stack. That's a really bad way of describing it. Um, you need to keep in mind that recurs in recursion, all the function calls are for the same function. The call stack doesn't contain uh, frame objects that represent functions. They represent function calls. And this is a very subtle distinction, but uh, maybe this will help. Let's use a stack of cards to represent the call stack and frame objects. Uh, this is a timeline of what the call stack looks like. So we first call factorial with an argument of 5. We push a new frame object card onto the call stack. This uh, frame object represents a function call that returns 5 times the factorial of 4. But it can't return yet. It has to call factorial. So we, move, we add another frame object with another function call to factorial here, this time with an argument of 4. Um, this function call pushes another frame object on the stack. Now there are two cards on the stack. But notice that this new frame object has its own local variable named number. Um, the other number variable is still there. It's just on the card below. So local variables are stored in these frame objects. And one thing that you really need to understand is that there are multiple local variables named number. They have the same name, but they're existing at the same time. We haven't replaced the old number variable. This is another thing that makes recursion really confusing uh, if nobody points this out to you explicitly. 
Anyway, we continue with more function objects pushed to the call stack until we reach the base case, which just returns one. And when that function call returns, we pop the frame object off the call stack. So the call stack starts getting smaller. We're back to the function call where the number parameter was two, but now we have all the information we need to return. So that card gets popped off the call stack and so on and so on and so on until the last card returns five times 24, which is 120, which is the factorial of five. After that, the call stack is empty and the execution is back in the global scope. So where does the five times four times three times two times one happen? That's, um, it's still, it's, it's hard to imagine all of this because it's sort of the call stack is changing across time, but here's another way that we can represent it. Let's just hard code our recursive function as multiple separate functions. So factorial five function returns five times factorial four functions return value and factorial four returns four times factorial three's return value and so on until we get to factorial one function which just returns one. So if you wanna know, here is where five times four times three times two times one happens. It's just that in our recursive example, all of this is in one function. Now, a non-recursive algorithm is called an iterative algorithm. So some programmers might tell you that like, oh, well, there's some things that you can only do with recursion. And that is completely wrong. Anything you can do with recursion, you can do with a loop and a stack. Look, I'll prove it. So you can write an iterative factorial algorithm, and you can write a recursive factorial algorithm. Here is an iterative factorial algorithm that emulates a recursive factorial algorithm. Notice it's not a recursive function. There's no functions in here. I'm, I'm not going to explain all of this. This is way too complicated. But um, I emulate a call stack with a Python list and I emulate frame objects with these dictionaries that contain the local variables, and I emulate the function calls by pushing and popping the emulated frame objects to the emulated call stack. Emulated stops sounding like a real word when you say it so often. Uh, this is completely ridiculous, but technically the code works. This will print out 120 uh, five factorial at the end of it. Um, yeah, anything you can do with, a recur with recursion, you can do with a loop and a stack. Uh, if you know what the Ackerman function is, yes, even recursive Ackerman can be implemented iteratively by using a loop and a stack. Here's the code for that. So, if we don't need recursion, and recursion is often confusing, when should we actually use recursion? So I thought about this, and I came up with an answer, and then I thought about it some more, and I came up with a better answer. Uh, we should use recursion when your problem has uh, both a tree-like structure and backtracking. So this is a tree data structure. It's used a lot in computer science. You have a root node at top, and it branches out to other nodes. And those nodes will branch out to other nodes, so trees have a recursive structure. Uh, yes, I realize that the tree is upside down. That's because the root node is the start, and on paper we write things from top to bottom. It's fine. Uh, lots of things in programming are upside down. So recursion is really suited to working with tree graphs because they have a recursive nature, um, especially like when you need to move down the tree graph, but then you also have to backtrack up. There's a lot of problems that you can sort of map onto trees and then use recursion to solve. For example, a maze can be solved with recursion because a maze is just really a tree data structure. The entrance is the root node, and then every time you come to an intersection, it branches off into multiple other nodes, and the exit is gonna be one of the other nodes. So if you backtrack from the exit, back to the entrance, that's the solution of the maze. Now, I don't have time to go into any tree traversal algorithms, but the recursion book has the code. Just take my word for it that it's actually simpler to implement this as a recursive function than doing it with a loop and a stack. But otherwise, you should not use recursion. Um, here's a problem with recursive factorial, though. If you try to calculate the factorial of 1001, you're gonna get a stack overflow because it needs more than 1000 function calls. Now there is a way around this. It's called tail call optimization. Long story short, uh, the Python interpreter can mess with the call stack and uh, prevent stack overflows. It's just you have to make the recursive call the last thing in the recursive function uh, because if there's no code af after the recursive call, you don't have to hang on to the local variables, which means you don't have to hang on to the frame object and you can prematurely pop it off the stack and then the call stack doesn't grow. And that's, yeah, uh, tail call optimization is this way that you can stop stack overflows. But there's another problem. Uh, the rec this recursive factorial function uh, can't be tail call optimized because you notice there's this one little bit of code that happens after the recursive call. So now 
you have to rewrite uh, all of your code to use this thing called an accumulator and change the base case around. This is just becoming more and more confusing. And then there's another problem on top of that. And that's the Python interpreter doesn't implement tail call optimization, and it never will. Uh, Guido Van Rossum has a couple of blog posts giving his reasons, but he's not alone. Uh, most JavaScript engines and the uh, Java virtual machine from Oracle also don't implement tail call optimization. It's, you can write tail recursion if you want. It's not actually going to happen uh, by the compiler or the interpreter. So despite the fact that factorial is the most popular example of recursion, you never actually want to use recursion to calculate factorials in the real world, ever. The other popular example of recursion is the Fibonacci sequence. This is another math thing. Um, you probably know this, the sequence starts with the numbers one and one, and the next number is always the sum of the previous two numbers. So you can, you can easily write a function that uses a loop to calculate these. But if you're too clever for your own good, you'll notice that the nth Fibonacci number is the sum of the two previous Fibonacci numbers. So this definition includes itself, and you can write a recursive algorithm for it. The base case is that the first two numbers, uh, one and two, are always going to be one. But notice that every recursive function call results in two more recursive function calls. So here's a tree diagram. If you try to find the sixth Fibonacci number, uh, you're going to end up with all of these other calls in exponentially growing number of function calls. And a lot of those are redundant. You're recalculating the same Fibonacci number over and over again. And to prevent this, there's a technique called memoization. Long story short, you can just uh, cache the return value the first time a function is called, and then uh, that way you don't have to repeat the calculation and blah, blah, blah. This is all just uh, more hacks that you have to put on top of complicated code just to make recursion work at all. And you can avoid all of it just by not using recursion. It's <laughs> like, I don't even know why people use recursion. It's just so confusing and frustrating. And, and I hate it. I hate recursion. I hate it so much. I hate it so much that I'm going to write an entire book on recursion. And then I'm going to give it away for free on the internet just so people can find out how terrible it is. You should never use recursion. It's so pointless. Except there is one area where recursion comes in handy. This is the Python instruction 2 plus 3. We call this an expression. Now, an expression is made up of values connected by operators. 2 and 3 are values. The plus operator is an operator. Uh, so we can, we can define an expression as value, operator, value. But expressions can be more complicated than this. Uh, the, this expression is 2 plus 3 times 3. So in this case, our expression is a value operator and another expression. And a value by itself is also an expression. It's just that a value is an expression that evaluates to itself. Now, wait a second. This looks familiar. The definition of expression includes itself. Not only that, but this is a recursive case and a base case. It turns out, if you want to create your own programming language, you need to understand recursion. Now, creating your own programming language is something that most programmers never even think of themselves as capable of doing. I mean, it, it just seems too big and too advanced. Like, where would you even start? I mean, I, I guess you would start with recursion, but it's, it's not just uh, making your own programming language. So there's lots of things in programming that we feel like we're just not qualified to work on because they seem too advanced. But if you start dabbling in these weird little areas of theoretical computer science, you begin to see that they're not just theory. You, you start getting ideas on how to build these much greater things that you would have never thought possible before. Understanding recursion lets you have bigger dreams. In conclusion, uh, recursion is a hack that produces an over-engineered mess, just that insufferable programmers can f uh, show off how smart they are. And recursion is an amazing concept that allows you to see new things in the field of programming. It's something that you don't need to be a genius to understand. It is uh, subtle, it is complex, it is beautiful, and it's worth your time and effort to understand. Thank you.